Hello, I'm Carol Off. Good evening, I'm Jeff Douglas. This is As It Happens. Coping with the fallout, a Canadian scientist just wanted to share the good news that the Fukushima accident posed no risk to North America. Then his critics went into meltdown. There are some lines of work where online harassment is unfortunately the norm, but you wouldn't expect chemical oceanography to be one of them. Jay Cullen runs a project that monitors nuclear contamination off the coast of British Columbia. And since the nuclear reactor meltdown in Fukushima, Japan in 2011, Mr. Cullen has been a busy guy. And since he started blogging about his findings, the blowback has been big and hateful. We reached Jay Cullen in Quebec City. Mr. Cullen, why did you start blogging about the Fukushima disaster in the first place? Well, given my training in oceanography as a chemical oceanographer, both my family and and friends, extended family, were asking me questions following the the meltdowns at Fukushima in 2011. And I started to realize that there was a a lack of of quality information available to the public Mm -hmm. about what the international scientific community was finding about the disaster. What kinds of questions were they asking? Well, specifically, people living in Victoria wanted to know how much risk there was to their health and and their family's health, uh, whether it was safe to be in the ocean, whether it was safe to consume fish from the Pacific. And even people contact me suggesting that they would leave Vancouver, Victoria for for parts in the interior of the continent. Or in fact, some people suggest that they might even move to South America. And did you, when you heard that, the concerns that you, did you think, well, maybe there's something to this? Or did you, before you tested it, did you find that there was any substance to what they were fearing? looking at what the international scientific community had been measuring and and what they had been reporting in the peer-reviewed literature, which is sometimes behind paywalls that are quite expensive to access or in technical language that's not easy to access either, that that information really wasn't getting through to people. Uh, That was determining what the risk was and what the scientific consensus was. just wasn't known really to uh, the average person uh, on the street. And what did you find? Well, what I found in, in looking at what colleagues of mine, in in fact, uh, had been measuring both in the Western Pacific close to Japan and certainly what Health Canada and and Department of Fisheries and Oceans had been um, finding through their own monitoring efforts that began immediately after the disaster. The levels that we were seeing, both in terms of atmospheric transport to Canada, um, releases to the atmosphere from the Fukushima site, and then what was predicted to happen and what we were seeing offshore in terms of seawater contamination, those levels really aren't reaching the sorts of concentrations that are likely to affect the health of the marine ecosystem or, or people living here in Canada. Did you find that there was mostly a consensus on that, that there really wasn't much of a threat of nuclear contamination on the coast of B.C.? Well, contamination itself is inevitable. There's no argument that the ocean is contaminated from Fukushima. Well, contamination itself is inevitable. There's no argument that the ocean is contaminated from Fukushima. The question really becomes what the levels that uh, we measure in, in the environment and in organisms mean for the impact on their health. And and uh, the measurements that exist in the scientific literature for levels that are seen in, in the North Pacific and in, in fish, salmon, for example, that we've been looking at returning to our streams and rivers, the, the activities that we're seeing from Fukushima um, certainly don't represent a, a health risk to either the organisms themselves or people who, who rely on the ocean for recreation or, or for foodstuffs. And how confident are you of the science? I have quite a lot of confidence. With this is the worst survey we've ever done. Okay, so that was your motivation. You thought, well, I just have to get them the information they need, and that can help them. But you didn't find it was so easy, did you? What were some of the reactions you had from the public? It's an interesting uh, response. A minority of people respond with questions of, Uh, transparency with which projects are carried out. They question the integrity of the scientists. They question the motivations of the scientists. And uh, in most extreme cases, just outright reject evidence that doesn't fit with their view of of what the disaster means for um, North Americans and, and the health of the Pacific. But you actually went further than that, didn't it? You got some threatening responses. Yes. Yes, I did. And so 
again, the, the perception is when people are afraid and they feel helpless, I, I think it's, it's a human instinct to uh, become angry. And uh, I definitely experienced some of that, uh, some of that anger. Like what? what for, instance, for example, what did you get? Um, threats against my own health and the health of my colleagues and scientists in general. Some perceived uh, conspiracy of the international scientific community to uh, hide the impacts of this disaster. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the response was that there must be some uh, financial motivation for scientists to be, in fact, lying to the public. So um, it was a very uh, a surprising reaction from, from my point of view. And how much of that did you get? Significant amounts. It's it's been ongoing since about 2012, late 2012. And uh, you know, on the one hand, I appreciate the desire for the truth, for for quality information. And these individuals uh, at base, I think, are are motivated by that longing for quality information. But on the other hand, it, it really highlights for me a lack of scientific literacy in the public. And in fact, a, a lot of people are unable or not really equipped to determine what. Um, or to determine between pseudoscience and, and actual science. And so some of the blowback uh, that I've received just hinges on a fundamental misunderstanding about basic mm -hmm. things about physics and biology. Do you think that people don't trust the pure science of it, or do you think that they might have, that may have been earned, that mistrust, because they think that the, the information emanates from the, the, the nuclear industry or from governments or parties who have a a vested interest in keeping the story the, the way they want it. I mean, can you understand why the public, some members of the public might not trust the information they're getting? I do understand. I do understand. And in this particular case, it really is kind of a perfect storm of, of a combination of factors. You, you have a large international governments, government science, a, a large uh, economic force in terms of nuclear power generation, and you've got ionizing radiation. Um, so whenever the public thinks about things nuclear, and you combine that with government and, and science, there's sort of a natural distrust. And communicating and communicating risk specifically about ionizing radiation in the, in the environment is fundamentally challenging because of that, that combination. So I do appreciate that there are scientists in the past who have misled the public. I, I'm thinking about things like cigarette smoking. Uh, but... Uh, in this case, there's really quite a, a broad consensus among the international scientific community. And uh, I appreciate that it's a complicated issue, and I'm more than happy to take on the challenge of, of communicating what we're finding. All right. It's good to talk to you, Mr. Cullen. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. We reach Jay Cullen in Quebec City. I do appreciate that there are scientists in the past who have misled the public. I, I'm thinking about things like cigarette smoking. Uh, Starting in the 50s, with the, uh, the wave of public concern about smoking causing cancer, the tobacco companies developed a very sophisticated, probably the most sophisticated effort to confuse the public about science, to confuse scientists about science. And now we've seen the, 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 a lot of the same people, in fact, have gone over to becoming climate deniers using exactly the same kinds of strategies. The tobacco companies knew nicotine was an addictive drug, yet they told Congress, I believe nicotine is not addictive. You see the same small group of people that the tobacco industry used working on all kinds of other issues. Dioxins, pesticides, chemicals in general, I mean, there's no evidence that these are harming us. And tobacco is a great metaphor uh, because we know those are lies. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. The, the activities that we're seeing from Fukushima um, certainly don't represent a, a health risk to either the organisms themselves or people who, who rely on the ocean for recreation or... I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. The levels that we were seeing, both in terms of atmospheric transport to Canada, um, releases to the atmosphere from the Fukushima site. And then what was predicted to happen and what we were seeing offshore in terms of seawater contamination, those levels really aren't reaching the sorts of concentrations that are likely to affect the health of the marine ecosystem or, or people living here in Canada. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And the, you know, and when we start to see a lot of those people are the same people, and a lot of the arguments are the same arguments, it makes it a little easier to say, hey, maybe we're being lied to. 
about other things, uh, including energy. The movie Merchants of Doubt is based on the book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. A key part of the strategy from the very beginning is to undermine the idea of scientific consensus. And one of the things they discovered in their own market research was that if you can persuade people that there's no scientific consensus, then people will think that it would be premature to act. So it's a very, very powerful strategy that we know works. And this is why you hear them saying as a kind of mantra, there's no consensus, the science isn't settled, you know, we have experts who don't agree, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty, there's considerable uncertainty, you know, you hear this phrase, considerable uncertainty, repeated over and over again. Science historian Naomi Oreskes authored a high-profile paper detailing the overwhelming scientific consensus on human-caused climate change. So the paper essentially just says that if you look at what scientific experts have to say on the subject of whether or not climate change is underway and whether it's mostly caused by human activities, the scientific community is clear the answer to that question is yes. And so the paper was simply just saying that. That's it. That was the whole thing. Nothing more. Yes, this is what scientists have to say. What was the response to the paper after it came out? Uh, well, that's when I started getting attacked. And that was when life sort of changed. It was a bit like, you know, going through the looking glass. And one of my colleagues at Scripps, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, said to me, you should talk to Ben Santer. Something sort of similar happened to him. Ben Santer, a senior atmospheric scientist at Livermore National Labs, was a key author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report in 1995. It was Santer who crafted the carefully worded key passage in the document, announcing for the first time that the balance of scientific evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. So my life changed. Um, lots of people didn't like that balance of evidence statement, and no personal animus, but I was, I was the carrier of that message. So you take down the message by taking down the messenger. Ben told me what had happened to him, um, and then the pieces began to come together because one of the people who had attacked Ben Santer was Fred Singer, and he was one of the people who was attacking me. The science around secondhand smoke hyped, the science around the ozone layer hyped going back 10, 15, 20 years. I'm happy to discuss all of these since I've been deeply involved in uh, these topics that you mention. Let me start with secondhand smoke. When I was in graduate school, I worked on stratospheric ozone depletion. And Fred would call me when I was in grad school and talk to me about how he didn't think humans were depleting ozone. And before that, he had real questions about whether humans were causing acid rain. He really criticized the work that connected secondhand smoke to, uh, to health impacts. And now he doesn't think global warming is an issue. So in 1995, you characterize secondhand smoke as a myth. We, you guys put out a press release on environmental myths uh, in 1995. Documents in the tobacco legacy library they got from, from all of the lawsuits over the tobacco companies, where a lot of this stuff has come out. And they say in there that they're extremely happy with your performance on this. This is from Brown and Williamson, and how they were arranging for media interviews for you, and you're doing uh, and so you did a big media, when you released this press release about MIS, you did this big media study. Uh, what are your views today on secondhand smoke? Do you think secondhand smoke is a carcinogen? How would I know? I'm no expert on, on cancer, and I don't know what's in secondhand smoke. I'm not a chemical toxicologist. Because I remember that day, um, I called Eric on the phone and I said, Eric, we need to write a book. Um, actually, I spoke to someone who was the Winston man uh, and he said when he was on the set he asked them uh, yes the tobacco executives do you guys smoke and they said no that's for poor people that's for stupid people that's for black people we don't touch the stuff listen they did that was a difficult job to know they had a product that caused cancer and was addictive well, contamination itself is inevitable. There's no argument that the ocean is contaminated from Fukushima. And to be able to keep selling it and to keep the question alive whether this is bad for you, that's not an easy job. But that is the playbook. And 
they develop a playbook saying doubt is our product. Just create doubt. Keep going. Um, and at the same time, you know, this small group of people, when the tobacco money dried up, they went to new products. And today, the big payday is energy. The question really becomes what the levels that uh, we measure in, in the environment and in organisms mean for the impact on their health. And, and uh, the measurements that exist in the scientific literature for levels that are seen in, in the North Pacific and in, in fish, salmon, for example, that we've been looking at returning to our streams and rivers, the, the activities that we're seeing from Fukushima um, certainly don't represent a, a health risk to either the organisms themselves or people who, who rely on the ocean for recreation or, or for foodstuffs. And tobacco is a great metaphor uh, because we know those are lies. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. And I started to realize that there was a, a lack of, of, of quality information available to the public mm -hmm. about what the international scientific community was finding about the disaster. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. The, the activities that we're seeing from Fukushima um, certainly don't represent a, a health risk to either the organisms themselves or people who, who rely on the ocean for recreation or, or for foodstuffs. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. The levels that we were seeing, both in terms of atmospheric transport to Canada, um, releases to the atmosphere from the Fukushima site, and then what was predicted to happen, and what we were seeing offshore in terms of seawater contamination, those levels really aren't reaching the sorts of concentrations that are likely to affect the health of the marine ecosystem or, or people living here in Canada. You know, I mean, well, I don't know whether they are just stupid or whether they are uh, infiltrated or whether they're key people there, you know, infiltrating it and blocking it. But the obvious way to take down the nuclear industry is through their own law, through the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which has to be applied in every single country, of course. But nobody seems to want to do it. Anyway, what I propose, propose to, to do is to try and get some Swedish organisations to bring the pressure on the Swedish radiological safety outfit called SSM. And so, because that's where you have to start. You have to start in the member state country. So anybody in another member state country who wants to try this trick on, well, it's not a trick, really. I mean, it's the law. Who wants to apply the law, shall we say, then get in touch with me and I will write, I will write the, the, the legal application for them and I will go there, someone pays my fare, if necessary, to present the evidence that the Basic Safety Standard Directive requires in order to force the re-justification of all practices involving exposures uh, of members of the public and, um, and workers.